We're here with Sarah Kenzior in uh, beautiful St. Louis. Um, and you're an anthropologist and a writer, um, probably most widely known for your Al Jazeera English column, which has a vast readership, and your, your Twitter feed, which has uh, also a vast... Uh, yes. What are they called? Tweeps? Followers? I um, guess, yeah. You have a following, <laughs> a, a huge following. Retweets, yes. And, and you're, right, you're right on Central Asia, which mm -hmm. is what your, your PhD was on. Um, yeah. But you also write about the state of higher education in general, social inequality in, in the US, and a whole host of uh, other topics. Um, so welcome to World 101X, <laughs> and thank you for having us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, so let's, let's get started in, in terms of how you got into anthropology. What, what led you down that path? Um, well, before I worked in anthropology, I was a journalist, uh, but I was frustrated with journalism. Um, I was working in journalism during 9-11, and a lot of the coverage, especially of events, um, foreign affairs, was very superficial. And so I wanted to do um, something deeper, particularly related to Central Asia, which was in the news a lot because America had stationed its bases in Central Asian yes. countries during the war in Afghanistan. Um, and so in order to do that, um, you know, I wanted to learn the languages of the countries. I didn't want to just sort of show up and talk to English speaking people. Uh, so I ended up getting um, an MA in Central Eurasian Studies at Indiana University. And while I was there, I was working for um, an anthropologist named Nazi Sharani as a research assistant. And so he got me very interested in anthropology, and I kind of thought, you know, this is more what I want to be doing. Um, you know, I don't really, I want to get out of the media world. It wasn't so much journalism in terms of the concept of, of writing about places. It was the way the media world was structured, and I saw an alternative in anthropology, um, you know, that the values of, um, you know, were, were something I endorsed much more. And so after that, I got a PhD here in St. Louis um, at Washington University, St. Louis, and continued my study of Central Asia only with a focus on digital media and uh, exiled political groups. And your PhD too was um, pathbreaking or it was different in was terms of <laughs> in terms of the field work mm -hmm. uh, and you've commented on this before in that um, anthropology generally uh, can be considered to be working with the exotic with the other mm -hmm. uh, and one of the sort of hallmarks is ethnography, to mm. go off somewhere to encounter the other in right. another place. And, but you worked on the internet, right. um, but not within a, a virtual community such as Second Life or games such mm -hmm. as uh, World of Warcraft, but you worked with a, a network right. in a way. So how, how did that influence the way you did your anthropology and the way you, you wrote about it? Well, the network was a network of exiled dissidents from Uzbekistan. And, you know, I myself am not allowed to go to Uzbekistan because while I was an MA student, I debunked um, the existence of a fictitious terrorist group that the government of Uzbekistan had justified the massacre of hundreds of people on. And so I'm not, you know, exactly on the guest list. Um, because of that massacre, large numbers of Uzbeks fled the country and they ended up all over the world. And as a result of that, um, for the first time, really, they were able to communicate with each other. You know, it's ironic because they couldn't do it in Uzbekistan because they were always being monitored and they were always under surveillance. But online, suddenly, all these scattered Uzbek dissidents began having blogs, began using social media, began having all these conversations about political issues that they'd never been able to have in a public space before. And so I thought that that was, you know, that was very interesting. And I wanted to continue to track that. I mean, I knew it was impossible for me to go to Uzbekistan, but also even if I was able to go, I wouldn't be able to have these conversations. You know, anybody who mm. I talked to would, would either, I think, say everything was fine and that the government was great, or I could, even worse, potentially endanger them by having them speak to me. Um, and so I wanted to avoid that. Uh, coincidentally, the head of one of the um, largest dissident Uzbek exile organizations is in St. Louis. The Berdamlink movement of Uzbekistan is headquartered in St. Louis. They had their first international conference at the Marriott Hotel downtown a few weeks ago. And so, you know, all this kind of led me to think, well, this is a very interesting project. Um, you know, in terms of methodology, obviously, you know, it's different. You know, I think anthropology is traditionally structured around specific definitions of place, you know, and space, and you're in that space. And online spaces are places that are really informed by the community. It's the participation and the interaction and the dialogue that forms the space itself. And so, you know, that was something I sort of had to struggle with while writing my dissertation is like, what are the boundaries of this? You know, what is this field? And so that in itself was a project um, in addition to, you know, understanding the political discourse of the, the dissidents who I was interviewing. More broadly, what, what role do you think anthropology does or should play in studying 
um, a vast network of people such as the internet. I mean, it's, it's massive. Well, I think anthropology has a really important role to play, and I hope that in the future, you know, we catch up. I think over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of anthropologists who have been more active in considering digital media a viable area for study. And when I began my project in 2006, people thought it was absolutely crazy. And, you know, and they would say things like, well, what does the internet have to do with politics? Or that's just something people in the West use. And then around 2009, with what was happening in Iran and especially um, in 2011 in the Arab world people were like whoa you know social media is important the internet is important and they began to understand why I was um, looking at what I was doing I think one thing that um, anthropology can do now that's invaluable is kind of counter this overwhelming emphasis on quantitative analysis of online media people look for things like how often is a keyword repeated how many users are on a particular site but they don't look at what they're talking about they don't analyze the conversation they take a kind of out of its context and I mean and that's what anthropology is about you know they're basically doing the kind of armchair anthropology these sort of superficial analyses of culture that you know anthropologists have been working against um, for decades and so I think there's a real opportunity for anthropologists to kind of um, embed themselves in these online communities over a long period of time really get to know the participants speak to them directly interview them about the stuff they're writing you know acknowledge that you know these two these online and offline spaces work together there's not necessarily you know this this separation this digital um, digital dualism you know I think I've, refer, I've heard mm. it referred to um, that people have and so I, I think there's just a wealth of possibilities um, for anthropologists who are willing to do this and you know another advantage for young anthropologists as our you know funding continues to decline is that <laughs> this is a very cheap way uh, <laughs> to do anthropology and I, I would encourage you know young students students who are you know just starting out in grad school if they want like kind of a small project to work their way in this is a way to do it without having to um to bank on grants or to sort of have to bank on other people approving your ideas before you go and pursue them sort of getting there it's already here in a way um, yeah because we're always using social media and it's there but people don't mm. see it you know like people don't know about the existence really of the uzbek groups that i look at in part because they're speaking uzbek and people don't speak mm. uzbek and to, so for them it's invisible and because anthropology emphasizes you know learning learning languages, um, you know, and, and learning languages that are more obscure, I think that they have the ability to kind of, you know, bring the um, subjects of interest more into the public eye. And another thing that's good is that it's with the direct kind of participation of the people involved. Like, I like that there's feedback. I like that the Uzbek communities who I write about can give me feedback about what I'm writing. You know, it's not just me, you know, going in, writing something and leaving. It's an ongoing participatory process. And it continues even in my non-academic work. And in a way, there's a constant dialogue, which mm -hmm. most anthropologists, I think, don't have because they write about other people. Right. And they, they give voice to people who might not have a voice, at least in the West or in, in, in academia. Right. Um, and there's a lot of essentializing going on there. But here, people are, are writing back immediately. <laughs> um, right. They're following you on Twitter. And, and so there's an ongoing dialogue. Right. And I, I think that's the way it should be. I mean, I think, you know, it's possible now because of technology and it, it, it's natural. I mean, it shouldn't be that we're writing about other people for only a Western audience or for career advancement or to, you know, rise for some sort of personal gain. I mean, this should be about, you know, knowledge and the, the spread of knowledge. And, you know, if you're writing about people, those people should be part of that, that you know, body of knowledge. So is, is, do you consider that to be part of the mission of anthropology, to democratize knowledge in this way and democratize participation? Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I would use the word democratize because feel, I feel like it just has all these weird political <laughs> connotations that people are going to take in some sort of way. But I guess, um, you know, broaden it and emphasize that people have a voice of their own and that we should listen to it and we shouldn't be, you know, saying, well, here's what this guy really means. We should take seriously what this guy's saying. And if he mm. says, you know, this is what I mean, we should be like, all right, then, you know, that's that. But not that's that, but we should not be uh, continually doubting the uh, intentions of people when they're straightforwardly stated. It's perhaps another way of phrasing it, um, engaging our publics. That sounds in, good. In terms of, because we have multiple publics, there right. are the people who we write with and about, and then there are the people we write for. Right. And I think in, in your work especially, there's, there's a, an, an immediate and, and extensive outreach that most anthropologists only dream of, because yes. uh, we, we write for... Um, journals and you right. know and you've written about this too in terms of a closed system almost mm -hmm. and it's very hard to break out of that often 
Right. Can you give some tips on how to break out of the system for... I mean, it's a hard thing to give a tip for because the system rewards and celerity. Like if you want to get tenure, if you want to get an academic job, things like, you know, tweeting or writing for non-academic places or writing for non-academic audiences are frowned upon. And so that puts a, you know, a young scholar in a very awkward position. It's, you know, do I have my ideas heard or do I get a job? And, you know, I don't fault people who go the other route. You're like you need money to survive. Like that's, that's not really like an option or a choice for a lot of us. You know, I, I did choose to leave academia and it was in part because I had other, you know, options like with Al Jazeera and places like that, um, you know, I guess a good way to kind of balance that, and I've seen academics do this, is to, you know, write for peer-reviewed journals, write this kind of work, but then also make a sort of smaller version that's accessible to the public. Like, just blog about your work. Like, I have a new article in Blah Blah Journal, and here's a summary of what it says. Because another advantage of that is that as long as you do it, then someone else isn't doing it for you. You know, there are a lot of these new, like, explainer sites, you know, Vox mm. and what have you, that basically take advantage of their access to LexisNexis, and they go in and they read these academic articles, they don't understand them, they write a summary of them that's usually inaccurate, and, you know, readers have no choice but to depend on their interpretation because they don't have access to the paywalled, you know, scholarly work itself. And so this is a great opportunity for scholars to, to present their own ideas and their own work with the public and to, you know, engage directly with them. Um, great. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of some of the, the topics you've touched upon, especially in your Al Jazeera articles, such as um, a critique of the higher education system, mm -hmm. um, but also social inequality uh, in the States and, and more broadly, um, what role do you think anthropology plays or what tools of the anthropological toolkit do you use to actually conceptualize or write uh, about these issues? Um, I mean, I think I focus less on theoretical uh, ideas and more on, you know, ethnographic methods. You know, I think the best way to find out what somebody is thinking is to ask them. And so, you know, in many disciplines, that really isn't the case. You know, they, they'll, you, they'll view people as data points. And I do think that there is a place for, you know, quantitative data, obviously. But I think when you're talking about things that are a little more abstract, like people's desires, their ambitions, their fears, their hopes, you have to speak to that person and you have to do it more than once. You know, mm. you, you, you can't just go with quick impressions and I think that that's something you know ethnographic methods are I think what's most invaluable in anthropology um, and should be practiced more uh, by journalists by journalists as well I think it would enhance journalism if you know the same sort of appreciation for people respect for people uh, was practiced I guess the one thing that that came across I think in the crikey interview you did was you talked a lot about um, suffering Mm -hmm. uh, in what drives you to write about certain things and, and you said something about along the lines of who is suffering, what causes their suffering and who benefits um, from this suffering and then that's sort of what, what grabs you and then you, you follow the, the suffering in a way. Right. Um, which, which is in a way what often happens in field work where right. a lot of the, you know, we have relationships with people and that's about emotional attachments and right. um, relationships that we, we, we have mm -hmm. um, and where wealth of the information I guess comes from. How do you maintain those sorts of relationships in an online world where you might not ever get to see this other person behind a, a moniker on Twitter or Facebook or Right. Or a blog. Well, I mean, I think, you know, most of us nowadays have friendships that we've developed through people online, you know, through people that we haven't met. You know, writing is a powerful form of communication. You know, you could communicate more about yourself through writing. I mean, I would say, you know, you met me like what, like 40 minutes ago. You know me through my writing. You know, you know how I think, you know my values and, and things like that through my writing. You don't know it through our brief interaction or, you know, your brief time in our house. So, you know, that's something to be, um, I think, just, you know, taken as seriously. You know, on, on the flip side, Side of that you know it's not like people aren't duplicitous or don't put on a show in quote real life either you know this is just part of human nature you know to sort of position yourself some way or to be open in some way and, and you never really know I, I don't think this divide between the digital world and the quote real world you know is as stark as, as it often is uh, portrayed to be and in some respects um, especially an anonymous blog can be much more revealing than a conversation even right. where you'd never know who what's the veil or what's the uh, 
Yeah, and that really depends on, I think, the, the politics and the political culture behind that. I mean, it's interesting mm. you bring that up with anonymity, because for, you know, I study Uzbekistan, which is an authoritarian regime, like, mm. it's a very different problem there. When someone is anonymous, it's not just this is somebody backbiting, this is someone gossiping, is like, is this somebody that's in the, you know, the SNB, which is the heir to the KGB, is this an op? You know, there's all sorts of different suspicions and doubts that get evoked depending on the, the politics um, of the context that surrounds that sort of online text. Um, just to change tack a little bit, um, what, one, one issue that we ask sort of everyone uh, in the series is if you could give us an, a short definition of anthropology, the way you practice it, what would it be? Um, I guess, you know, the study of traditions, beliefs and practices and, you know, like I said, I mean, I know that that sounds very broad. I think anthropology can be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, I did an interview with, uh, with Savage Minds that I think laid this out a little more explicitly than I'm <laughs> able to now. Um, you know, but like I said, I, I think that what is most invaluable in it is the methods and the kind of questions that ask. And also, you know, kind of what you were getting at when you're talking about suffering, that questions should be led by the subject. You know, you can go in with your own research question and you'll often end up as an anthropologist in a completely different direction because you're following the lead of the people you're talking to, you're finding out what matters to them, what's important to them. And, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily unique to anthropology, but I do think it's something that people strive for. It's actually thought of as a virtue and not a fall, you know, not as a flawed research plan, but as a, you know, pragmatic and accurate representation of what people are really experiencing. And, you know, and I, I support that. In, in terms of uh, the internet as perhaps a new frontier for anthropology, do you think anthropology has to change as a discipline to better adapt to using the internet, both as a research um, place mm -hmm. and uh, as a, an outreach tool in a way? Um, I mean, anthropology needs to change. You know, I think it was Jillian Tett who said, you know, it's, it's committing suicide, but, you know, intellectual suicide, I think. But anthropology is in the context of academia, and academia is in the context of this larger economic structure, and all of that is contributing, I think, to the limitations that anthropology and anthropologists are experiencing right now. And so, you know, in terms of um, how they view digital media, I think especially young anthropologists really are interested in this question of digital media, and it's becoming harder and harder to kind of ignore it and to just say, oh, I'm going to go to this place, and I'm going to ignore everything everybody's doing on their phone. I'm going to ignore everything they're doing on the internet. I'm going to ignore their own, you know, interaction with the larger world because that interaction is informing their local experience. You know, you can't really leave it out. And so I think finally people have um, come to acknowledge this. It's no longer as much of a career destroyer as it once was, you know, to investigate digital media. But I think this sort of idea that a topic has to be trendy or be approved um, instead of just being a worthwhile um, point of knowledge to pursue, that needs to go because that's what's happening now is careerism. People are thinking of, I'm going to study this because this is the kind of thing that might get me a job. This is the kind of thing people are interested in now instead of, this is an important research question. This is underexplored. This will contribute valuable knowledge. I mean, I think it's more satisfying actually to the scholar to mm -hmm. pursue those latter questions in this economy because, you know, odds are you might not get a job. And if you don't get a job, at least you've done something, you know, you've made a contribution, you, you've brought something new to the fold, and, and you will enjoy it more if you study what you're interested in and passionate about. Absolutely. I think passion, you know, passion is really important in what we do. That sustains us yeah, through field work or, <laughs> like, or hours and hours spent trawling through uh, the internet. Right, you know. right. Um, it's interesting that you, you, you mentioned the sort of, um, I guess, fads often. I remember when I started, I was working on Islam and mm -hmm. you know, identity politics. And at the time I thought, oh, this probably will have lots of career opportunities because Islam... Did you start Islam... in the 2000s or...? I did actually, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know so many people in your position, but yeah. <laughs> and it never eventuated. Yes. Because the fad, it was there, but then people moved on. Right, exactly. Uh, much like you've, 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 talked, or you've written about Uzbekistan and Central Asia, right? right? That was it's also... It's being defunded mm -hmm. at the moment because, well, the troops are being withdrawn. Right. <laughs> it's sort of, we're moving on to the next topic. Right. And, and so it's, it's often counterproductive to follow a fad because right. chances are you'll be at the tail end of it right and you'll miss it right I mean I think you should follow what you're interested in and I you know and I think that topic you know the, the topic of Islam is something that still should be continually studied it's frustrating to me you know I know a lot of people because I was also in grad school maybe I guess it's the same time as you who who studied Islam because it was so 
poorly, you know, represented in the media after 9-11, there were so many awful popular works being written that they saw this as like, hey, you know, we're going to do some real work, some real field work, you know, talk to actual Muslims and, and debunk these stereotypes and share, you know, broader knowledge with the world. And what's happening, of course, is, you know, those people can't find jobs or their work isn't being published. And it's a big, it's a loss. You know, I know of great dissertations on like on Muslims in Kyrgyzstan, on Muslims in Azerbaijan. No one reads them. No one sees them. And so, and it's because of this careerist structure where the people um, you know could not publish or could not uh, find their work and moved on to other things and so that knowledge just kind of sits there with with nobody picking up on it and that's a real shame what, what do you think needs to change because we're talking about broader systemic issues beyond mm -hmm. anthropology in a way um, mm -hmm. in in terms of the higher education system in in terms of furthering knowledge seeking for for, for the sake of knowledge seeking right. rather than these fads that are dictated by governments or uh, certain, um, you know, oh, it's national security or it's the economy that are driving the right. research agenda. How, can we change it? Um, I mean, I think that people, you know, who are in positions of power, like heads of department, people running journals, you know, et cetera, can change it. And some are, you know, if you look at cultural anthropology, mm -hmm. they've gone open access, you know, which obviously allows a lot more, you know, reports and scholarly work to be available to the public. I think that if people weren't so afraid, you know, if younger people weren't so afraid about getting a job, they might be willing to be a little more experimental in how they share their works and their content. On the other hand, again, I don't fault anybody for being afraid because when your livelihood is at stake, you know, that stokes fear. And so I think it's kind of, you know, trying, one thing that you can do yourself, even if you lack money or power, is to at least try to eradicate this culture of fear to support other scholars, um, you know, who are making their work public, uh, to participate in these online communities that are, you know, dedicated to that. You know, I think there, there are small things we can do, but a lot of this is, you know, institutional limitations. And, and there are, as you say, lots of um, interesting projects, open access journals um, and small scale communities, but it's, it's changing the larger system, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, a problem. Uh, in the US, you've written a lot about the adjunctification of yes. the system where more and more uh, academics are adjuncts, yes. so they don't have a, a full time position. And so people have to teach at different schools, a course here, a course there. How is that impacting um, how people teach and how people do research. I mean, it makes things extremely difficult to do their research. You know, an adjunct here makes an average of about twenty-seven hundred dollars uh, per course, and so in order wow. to even exist below the poverty line, you need to be teaching about eight courses. Most people aren't even doing that. You know, there's some adjuncts that are on food stamps. If you're able to kind of scrap together a living, it doesn't leave you a lot of time for scholarship. And that's often a huge shift from what people experienced in graduate school, where they, you know, the focus was on the research, the dissertation, they had endless amount of time to devote to that. And so I think that there's a real economic problem with people's, you know, ability to participate in a scholarly community. It means that those who can are those who can afford to you know and that means that those are the people who, who follow this you know kind of tenure track route and you know often are more willing to conform to certain social expectations as well uh, and so that's a problem you know I think you need to change the economic model of hiring in academia it's not going that way you know public universities are being defunded um, adjuncts are sort of taken as par for the course uh, I think the adjuncts themselves are very upset about this and are beginning mm -hmm. to um, you know kind of rally and occasionally call for for strikes or for broader organizations but you know it, it will uh, take time and again you know I think one thing people can do is to support those people you know vocally support the adjuncts who are, are you know rallying for better pay and for better hours and to not have to teach as many classes not just for the sake of it being a labor issue but for it being an intellectual issue um, we're quite lucky in Australia where that hasn't happened <laughs> to that um, extent but the government is changing rules at the moment so mm -hmm. it is an ongoing fight, I right. guess. Um, and so it is intelle about intellectual, but it's also uh, about labor issues. Right. And I guess, um, do you think there are lessons learned from anthropology or anthropological work in other places? Because one of the things anthropology, I think, does quite well is comparative mm -hmm. work. Um, and too often, when we're thinking about academia, right. I think too often we live in, oh, I'm an Australian, or I'm an academic, right. academic in Australia. And so I know my system mm -hmm. and I'm a world away from the U.S. system mm -hmm. and well, it won't affect me, but it will. Right. right. So that we're actually 
should be doing much more comparative analysis in right. a way uh, with our colleagues, um, with fellow anthropologists or just fellow academics. No, I agree with that. And, you know, another thing is to sort of use the insights you've learned from your own research and apply them to your own community, you know, because a lot of what I write about is just power and how people accept their own exploitation, how people become afraid to challenge dominant power structures, whether it's an authoritarian regime in Uzbekistan or whether it's, you know, an economic um, structure in the United States that, that keeps people in their place. You know, and I'm not saying that those things are equivalent in any way in terms of, you know, the brutality, but in terms of the mindset that the people um, in it experience, I mean, I hear a lot of the same things. And so, you know, I, I think it's just, it's good to read broadly. It's good to, you know, think creatively, think, you know, are there similarities? Are there things that we can learn, um, you know, from other places and apply them to our own lives and, you know, not be hypocrites about it? You know, it's one thing to go to, like, the anthropology conference where you're paying, like, thousands of dollars to go, and then you get up there and you talk about, you know, the horrible neoliberal model. I mean, and, and it's just, it's, it's unbelievable, like, the level of hypocrisy. So I think if we just kind of, you know, use the lessons that we already know and apply them to our own community of anthropologists and of educators, you know, that would be beneficial for everybody. Can you, can you give us some insight in um, how you actually go about, um, you're talking about the US in this case, how do you go about doing your fieldwork? So is it partly over Twitter? Is it over through online communities? That I do now, you mean? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I'm mostly working as you know, a journalist and a writer. I still do field work on Central Asia. Because I'm not full-time employed as an academic, I have partnerships. I just had a paper published, I think, two days ago um, about Azerbaijan. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was very funny because it was submitted two years ago. And you know, I left academia. I, I was in academia and it was submitted. And then I left. And then it was accepted. My two partners are, are both professors. And they were like, yeah, you know, this goes on the CV. It sells for 10 and I'm like, okay. You know, I mean, I was happy that, that it's out. Obviously, it's on First Monday, um, the site First Monday, which is an open access but peer reviewed site um, about the internet use in Azerbaijan. And so, you know, that's been helpful for me is to find um, partners. You know, I'm not really like a partner kind of person. You know, I, I have a unique writing voice. Um, and so when I write my stuff, I usually do it solo. But for some of these social media projects, I've found that it's helpful to kind of divide, you know, looking at the information, gathering the information, doing the interviews, writing up the analysis. Analysis. You know, we all have things we know that we're good at, and so, you know, we, we divide the work in that way, and that makes it possible to kind of stay afloat without it monopolizing too much of my time, because as you know, you know, I do not get paid for this, so. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this, actually. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> um, in terms of, as an anthropologist with a huge Twitter following, mm -hmm. um, you have a different public, I guess, to most anthropologists in the way we write or in the way we communicate. Um, is that, a, is that a, something that you're aware of when you're writing? Is that something you're using, mm -hmm. you're, you're very conscious of in the way you interact with? You can go and find my academic work. You can find my popular work. And it's written in pretty much the same voice. I mean, I, I try to make it you know, intelligent, but to not use jargon, to not make it inaccessible. Um, you know, if you read my anthropology work, obviously there's going to be citations or references to literature that most people haven't read, but I try to explain what that literature said. So, you know, a lot of times I just run this stuff by my mom, you know, who doesn't know anything about any of this or anything about Central Asia or, you know, any of this stuff I do, but is a, you know, a reasonably intelligent person. And so I'll send it to her and be like, you know, did you get it? Like, did you understand what I was trying to say? And, you know, if she's like, no, this was confusing. I will go back and I will look at it because, you know, my goal is to have my work comprehensible to everybody. I don't understand the point of not doing that. And that's not really anything new. I mean, there are plenty of scholars who, who wrote in that tradition. You know, Edward Said, I think, mm -hmm. is a good example. Um, and so that's the kind of practice that I want to emulate where anybody can read my work. You know, I get emails from high school kids. I get emails from fast food workers. And I get emails from professors. And, and they like what I'm doing. And I'm happy to have this, you know, diverse audience. It's nice straight for Al Jazeera English because it's an international website. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have a... A readership from around the world and that's great because that gives me lots of insights into you know different countries and different perspectives and you know so it's a good deal. <laughs> Do you think Twitter has has honed the people who use it well uh, like yourself has honed you to write and get across a point very concisely to the point and in, in easy to understand language rather than even just abstracts of journal articles that right. are often you know what is this about? <laughs> I mean I tended to be 
kind of concise before I used Twitter. Now I'm wondering if my brain is like on autopilot to go to 140 character increments, you know, because I use it so frequently that, that maybe there is some effect on the process. I think it helps. You know, I, I do think that, you know, shorter words are better than longer words. Shorter sentences are better than longer sentences. And so, you know, I applaud the character constraints in a way of Twitter because I think it forces you to think creatively and to try to think about different ways of expressing your ideas. When I'm writing an essay, obviously I'm not counting my character limits and I'm just trying to get a, my point across. But um, you know, using Twitter, I, I think, has been helpful. If you read my articles, you know, sometimes you'll see things I tweeted uh, show up in the article a couple weeks later because I tweeted it, and then started thinking about it, and then that line ended up. So you know, it's all part of the same process. That's actually that's a, that's a really good way of doing it. Um, and or then writing. Or, or taking parts of your article back out and blogging or, or, or right. tweeting well, about it. Sometimes I do that too. I mean, mostly just to like say, hey, look, I wrote this thing. Go check it out. And it's better, you know, I think to quote directly from it than for me to vouch for whether it's interesting or not. People can decide that on their own. And if I quote an excerpt, that's a you know a good way of allowing people to decide. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for having oh, us, Sarah. This is really you. interesting um, to get insights on how to get out to a broader public. I think um, with you know, still anthropological insights about all kinds of issues now in the U.S., but also about Central Asia, a place that most people know very little about. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to to get the message out. And I think anthropologists, um, more anthropologists, should use th use those means to get the messages out um, because there's such a depth of information that anthropologists have accrued. Right. And we're sitting on it. Right. And it's about <laughs> <laughs> taking the shackles off in a way and, and letting it out. Right. Um, I agree. And more of that should happen. All right, then. <laughs> well, thank you. Great. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you.